we for the last few weeks have been doing a series entitled Jesus from the book of Matthew. We've been looking at Matthew 14 and 15. And today we come to our final week in that series. So we're going to be reading from Matthew 15 from verse 1 through to verse 20. And it's a really interesting story that has, I've been thinking about it a whole heap obviously in preparation for this morning. And so I'm going to read some of the verses and then try and explain a little bit some of my thoughts around it it, with help of this table and this illustration next to me here. Matthew 15 verse 1, Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat exclamation mark. So I remember my mom had a big deal about us washing our hands before we ate. But it's, a, it's an odd verse that appears in the Bible. The Pharisees and teachers of the law, these were religious people. They studied w- what they had, which was the Old Testament, the Torah, in particular, that was the first five books of the Bible. And they traveled quite a way to get to where Jesus was. It says they were from Jerusalem. Jesus was up in Galilee, and it was be a good kind of three-day journey by foot to get to him. And you think it's a little weird that you go all the way to ask him, why don't you wash your hands before dinner? There's a little more obviously packaged into this. The the Pharisees and teachers of the law were very, very, very attentive to the detail of the Torah. So every law that was in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they, they obeyed all of those. But they were so passionate about all of that stuff that they developed what was called rabbinical tradition or the tradition of the elders. This wasn't the Bible, this wasn't the law, this was like the the add-ons. They had hundreds and hundreds of add-on laws. So actually nowhere in the Torah did it say you had to wash your hands before you ate, and it had nothing to do with hygiene. The only people who were required to wash their hands were the priests before they prevented, presented sacrifices, and they had to wash their hands as a sign of ritual cleansing. It was a sign of letting God know we're here for this duty of sacrifice. That was in the Torah and the law. In the tradition of the elders, that extended this idea to say, well, every true Jew needs to wash their hands before they eat. And there was a particular way that they needed to wash their hands. So everyone around Jesus knew what they were talking about. But clearly, Jesus' disciples didn't follow this tradition of the elders as closely as these guys would have liked. Jesus then engages in this very interesting discussion with them. And he says, but you guys dishonor God because your interpretations, he uses another technical uh, technicality of their law, he says, you just change it like that and like that. So God said, honor your father and mother, but your little traditions, you do this with your money so that you don't need to help out your folks. And then he says this in verse seven, this is pretty strong stuff. He says to these people that were ask, asking these questions, you hypocrites, it's like, hey, Jesus, didn't you come to like get a whole lot of people to follow you? I'm just putting it through Steve Wimble imagination here. And, and then these guys come and, they are, and you just say, you hypocrites. And he gets even stronger. He says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. Now, Isaiah lived 700 odd years before. So Jesus goes back into the Bible, draws this verse out from Isaiah and uses it to point out their faults. He says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, and he quotes now from Isaiah, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, and their teachings are merely human rules. Isaiah 29, 3 is where that comes from. Then it says, Jesus called the crowd to him, so this is everybody else, and said to them, listen and understand. You know, it's possible to listen and not understand. And if you're doing that in the last five minutes, um, He says to them, listen and understand, what goes into someone's mouth does not defile them. Referencing the washing and the food thing. He says, but what comes out of their mouth defiles them. Peter and his disciples then come to Jesus and they say, do you realize that those guys were really offended with you? They're really upset. And Jesus has got further strong things to say against the Pharisees and teachers of the law that are so hung up on the tradition of the elders, not, not the actual Bible. Then later on it says, Peter said in verse 15, please would you explain this parable to us? What on earth did you mean? It's not what goes in that's important, it's what comes out. And Jesus says to them, are you still 
so dull? Like, guys, you spent all this time with me. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. This is a really interesting story. It's, it's interesting because of the technicality, so you need to try and figure or understand that a little bit. But this, the last few verses are the real heart. This is the crux of this whole story. And for me, this story is about three things. First of all, this story is about words versus heart. Words versus heart. These Pharisees and teachers of the law had traveled a long way to ask him this technical question around the application of the law, about this ritual hand washing. And Jesus' answer to them is to quote from something Isaiah said 700 years before. So what Isaiah said was basically 2,700 years from where we are. But listen to how applicable it is, Isaiah's words, even to us. He says, if you don't mind just putting it up, uh, the next one, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. He's saying to these guys that are around him, these guys asking the question, chaps, you've got a form of religion. You, you've got a form of godliness, a form of like connecting in with the Bible. You read the Bible, but it's only on the exterior. You've got the words to go along with that. Maybe in our day, Jesus would say something. You've put your kids in a Christian school for those that are at Curra or any others. We've got so many great schools in this area where the Bible is taught. You occasionally drop them off at Sunday school or children's church. Sometimes you even go along to church and possibly even read the Bible and say grace. But beware of honoring me with just words or with just the outside actions. Effectively what Jesus is saying is I'm looking for your hearts. I'm looking for your heart. What goes on in the inside, we can keep hidden from most people most of the time. And some people some of the time, but we can't keep it hidden from God any of the time. So Jesus looks through all this kind of Christianese speak that these guys have got, all this technical language, and he just says, chaps, those are just words, but your hearts are far from me. You're not really interested in getting to know me. You just, it's just the, the trappings. It's just what's happening on the outside. God, in other words, is looking for more than just lip service from me and from us. God is looking for our hearts to be connected, that we are Christ followers, not just that we reference Christ in our language. The second thing the story about, <clears throat> it's a story about sin. When Jesus moves from dealing with the lips to dealing with the heart, he says it's not what goes in, it's what comes out to explain the matters of the heart. And this story gets really, really, really challenging round about now, okay? This story is written not only in Matthew, but also in Mark. So I'm taking the Mark version, just the ending, and I'm transplanting it because it's slightly longer. It's got slightly more words. So that's not to say Matthew was wrong. He maybe just quoted some of it. Mark quoted a little longer. So this is how Mark recounts the story. He says, Jesus went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. And then the next slide, I'm just listing in bullet point what Jesus said next. He said, these are the evil thoughts that come from inside. Sexual immorality. Sexual immorality is any sexual expression outside of heterosexual marriage. Anything outside of that, Bible lumps together as sexual immorality. It says that starts at the heart and then becomes actions. Theft. So, well, I'm glad I came to this morning's meeting because I'm not a thief. 
And I don't, I don't steal millions and billions. But if you took 10 bucks that doesn't belong to you, or lack integrity in any way, in some ways that's a thief. I heard a, a preacher, I visited the US once and just popped into a church and heard this guy preaching on one of the 10 commandments, thou shalt not steal. And he said, for many of you guys, this is easy because you, you, know, you don't consider yourself a thief. And then he told the story. He said he was going to visit one of the business people that wasn't his church, got convicted of fraud and ended up in jail. And he went to visit this guy in jail. On the way back from this jail visit, he went through a toll booth. And as he was going through, he checked the change that he got. He had paid in cash and got change and realized that he had been overpaid by a dollar or two. And he was about to pull off counting his good luck when another thought struck him and he, he just turned to the lady, gave her back the money that she had given him and said, you've overpaid me, gave her the change back. Her eyes just filled up with tears. She said, thank you so much, sir. At the end of the day, that would have come out of my pay. Thank you so much for paying it back. So his message, in his message, he says, so what makes me different, the $2 thief or the $2 million thief? We're still thieves. I was feeling great in that message until that point. The third thing Jesus mentions in his list is murder. It's okay, well, that's great. I haven't murdered anybody in my life. But sadly for all of us, Jesus puts anger alongside murder in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 to 7. He says, the fourth thing, this is on the list of 12, Jesus says the word adultery. Now, that might be applicable to some people here. Possibly it's even a hidden sin. But Jesus goes much further than that in the Sermon on the Mount. He says it's not just the act of adultery that's sinful, it's the act of lust that is sinful. Whew, that's gone properly quiet here this morning, and I, I could understand why. He says it's from within the heart that greed comes, fifthly. Every one of us, every one of us wanting more. At some level, this is something that ticks a box inside of every one of our hearts. From when we were kids, none of us shared very easily. Some of us worse than others, but in the human condition is one of greed. Malice, the desire to harm someone. Well, it might not be harming them like stabbing their tires, but maybe just saying the odd thing, being unkind. Deceit, to lead some, mislead somebody. Lewdness. Again, this relates to uh, being offensive in how I speak or act, particularly in a, a sexual or lustful way. Envy. Melville used this sin a little earlier, speaking about Jackie in particular. <laughs> I was so grateful that Mel had this great umbrella, just blessing him and saying, well done, and so do you know what the dictionary definition of envy is? Is being discontented or, or resentful because of somebody else's possessions or qualities. You can have envy about how somebody else looks, how they speak, the luck that they've had in life, the stuff that they have. It doesn't take much to get us envious. Just a couple of bad days somewhere along the line. We envy what other people have. And why do they deserve that instead of me? Or am I the only one who's occasionally been guilty of that. Slander, Jesus said. Now, this still, I'm quoting Jesus' words. This is all apart from the brackets. These are Jesus' words in the verse. Slander means speaking ill of somebody else, usually when they're not around to defend themselves. I mean, you guys, not, not, probably no one here has ever done that, so this was for the other people Jesus was talking to. <laughs> arrogance was the second last thing in the list. Now, arrogance is thinking none of those apply to me. <laughs> then there's a box for, you, for us to tick. Arrogance, thinking I can do things my own way. I know better. I can, do it with, I can do life without God, without other people's help. That all falls into arrogance. And then his final word in that verse is folly. And the Bible speaks a lot about folly being basically anything that's outside of God's ways. So Jesus... Uh, sorry, just to finish this verse, 
He says all these evils come from inside and defile a person. Come from inside and defile a person. Jesus is, in other words, saying that every single one of us have got a problem in our hearts. And it's not the outside, it's not the hand washing, it's not the religious ceremony that he's so worried about. It's what goes on on the inside. I was thinking about this verse and this idea, and I thought about this, I, this illustration. Let's say that this, this is a brand new white shirt. Let's say that it represents my heart, the way it's designed to be. Now, if the shirt was on the outside, I'd want to keep it clean. But sadly, many of us are more worried about our clothes than about our hearts. And Jesus says, guys, it's, it's not so much about what you do on the outside, the ritual washing and all that kind of stuff, your kind of religious jargon, whatever, however you consider relig religiosity. He said it's, it's got to do with the stuff that goes on in your heart. And that's a pretty challenging list of things that go on in our hearts. And I got around to think about this idea that sin, because this story is about sin, Jesus, is used, Jesus used the words defiles. I'd like to use a, a different English word that means the same thing, is that sin stains our hearts. That's why Jesus is so big on this. I got into social media a little while, a couple of days ago when I had this idea and I, I asked this question on Instagram, what are the things that cause the worst stains? And I got some replies from some of you. One mom just replied, children. And then another mom replied to her reply saying, children with cokies. And then somebody else said, permanent marker. And somebody else listed a whole lot of things. I brought some of them along with me. But let's say that this permanent marker represents every time I envy somebody. And in my heart, Jesus says, it stains and it defiles. And, and every time I, I get angry with people, it's like, on this, this is permanent marker, on my heart, stains come, and this is Jesus' big deal, is that sin stains, and any sin stains, and suddenly this beautiful clean shirt that I had, is there any mom here who'd be up for trying to get the stain out? I'm saying moms because us dads are just too cowardly, most of us. I had somebody else reply to my post that tomato sauce stains pretty badly. And you see, we look at things like adultery, and we say, well, that's obvious, that's like tomato sauce, but what about the sin of lust? What about the sin of anger? What about the sin of slander? Oh, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to be mean, I just thought that Mark Felix should know about what Jordy did last week, and just so that he can pray for him, and we were just talking, and, but Mark goes away with a totally different idea of Ian, because I slandered Ian, and Ian had no even place to defend himself. And then this, this sin doesn't just, it's not just a splotch, it gets rubbed into my life because I've become so used to my ways, it just becomes normal, and suddenly my shirt is... unclean. But I get used to that, and, and what I start doing is I say, well, my shirt is whiter than your shirt. You think I'm bad, you should see the other guy. You know, I, I, don't, have any pro I don't have as much problem with sin as the next guy. And what am I guilty of then? Self-deceit and uh, arrogance. This is black coffee. And this was what somebody said, coffee stains are very difficult to get out, so let's have a whirl. So my arrogance starts to discolor my heart. And it starts to soak in and starts to become, along with my permanent marker, my tomato sauce, my anger, my, all my stuff, my world, it's, it starts to look not that cool, not that appetizing, 
but I'm good because, you know, on the, on the outside my clothes are fine. Well, in my opinion, it doesn't matter about the inside if I can just disguise it on the outside. And then there was somebody who, very interesting, a few people wrote lamb curry is one of the things that gives the most amount of stain. So I've just got curry powder here. Because all of these different sins have got different qualities about them. And some smell quite nice but cause terrible stains. And some taste curry-ish. But the afterburn of sin... And this is, this is a big deal, because sin stains. I'm hoping it doesn't stain my other clothes, but is there anybody here this morning who feels that if I added enough stainful products onto that, that you could get that back to brand new white again, that t-shirt? So if you gave it to me quickly, I could maybe spray it with a whole arsenal of different things and maybe get it to just mildly brown. But we look at the stains at the tomato sauce. This is with physical garments and the permanent marker and the curry powder. And we just think, well, there's only one thing to do with that shirt. Just chuck it in the bin. Start again. But you can't do that with your heart. And part of the problem, this is why Jesus says stuff like this, part of the problem is that most of us wearing, not most of us, every single one of us with the dirty heart, we don't think it's that dirty. We just get used to the smell. We get used to living with the stain. In fact, we get so good at it, we defend our stains. We try and paint them into little pieces of art. So well, I'm just human. Oh, this is me. I'm that kind of guy. I'm that kind of lady. That's from a human point of view. You might even get enough people around you with the same color stains to agree with you and say, you do you. You just be the best angry you you can be. You be the most foolish you. Just You, got, you find enough people to high five you. You think, well, this isn't actually a stain. It's a mark of pride. It's a badge of honor. That's a human point of view. And none of us like the idea of a stained heart, so we look for support from each other. But, but then from God's point of view, and Jesus is God, so from his point of view, he looks through all the clutter, all the like good talk, the outer clothing type stuff, and he just goes straight to the thing. He says, you guys are so worried about a few germs and ritual washing, food going into the mouth. He says, you should hear the stuff that comes out of your heart. So your stomachs can deal with the germs, but your heart is stained. Now, this is, for me, the, the, the purpose of him saying stuff like this is to bring us to the point of realizing that there is nothing in this world that can unstain the human heart. That's why it needs something out of this world. There, can, I, can I repeat this? There is nothing in the world that can unstain a human heart. Every act of anger, every blotch of tomato sauce, every act of folly and sexual immorality, the stains that sin has, nothing can undo those stains. I can try and be a slightly better version of myself, but it's still a version with a stained heart. And so no matter which blocks the I tick or which I think was well, not really me, if, if I tick even one, and for most of us it's most, I can just say, well, I've got a stain, I, I live a stained life. And that's a really good thing to get to because then I can find the solution. See, if I don't think my clothes are dirty, then I don't put them in the wash. If I don't think my heart's stained, I don't ever look for the solution anyway. And so thirdly, the story points us to Jesus. Because there's only one thing that can actually remove stains from the human heart. And the Bible's answer to this, like, it uses really odd phraseology. And let me read the verse, Hebrews 9, 14. How much more then will the blood of Christ cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? This idea of the blood of Christ, if you're not a Christ follower, you're not familiar with church, and someone starts talking about the blood of Jesus, 
Look, I'm with you that that sounds a little bit weird, okay? But the profoundness of it goes something along these lines, is that sin isn't just a stain, sin is also a crime. And crimes deserve punishment. And Jesus didn't come to just give me better external clothing so with my stained little heart I can lead a better life. He came to remove the stain from my conscience and remove the consequence of my crimes against God, all of these things. Those crimes, in fact, are so weighty that they deserve eternal punishment. The Bible calls that eternal death. You don't just solve that with a little bit of jick or omo. It required somebody else to die in my place. So the reference to the blood of Jesus is the reference to his physical blood that literally was beaten out of his body. And when that phrase is used in the Bible, it should be a trigger phrase to me to remind me it's his blood, not your blood, Wimble. For all eternity, you got a shot and a clean heart in a relationship with God because of the blood of Christ, because he died so that you can live. So it's this gory, gruesome, and yet incredibly powerful picture of what Jesus wanted to do for me. If I don't acknowledge that I've got any stains or anything wrong with me, I can never find the solution. I'll just end up walking along in my, with my stained heart for the rest of my life and sadly for all eternity. But Christ didn't come just to like, make it slight, a slightly less version of brown. He came to make me a brand new person. Not just a better version of the stained me brand new person. And that's why this verse uses these beautiful words, cleansed. It's the only thing in the universe that can make a heart completely clean again is Christ's grace and his forgiveness. And if you don't mind putting up those words, take this list of all of these stains of sin, the stuff that's like always normal, I think that's just the world I live in. And on every one of them that Christ says, I want to come and cleanse that, take it out, that it's not part of your future. I want to take away sexual immorality. If you just click as I'm going along, take, I want to wash it. I want to, that the branding on your heart is purity. I don't want you to live with the stains. That instead of theft is integrity. Instead of murder and anger, self-control. Instead of adultery and lust, that that uh, coloring the rest of my life, that I live a faithful, faithful life to the person I'm married to or the person I may be married to one day. I'm faithful. That instead of greed, I live a life of generosity, that that's the change, the, the cleansing of my heart. That instead of malice, I live with kindness. And instead of deceit, I live with honesty. And instead of lewdness, I live with just respect for people of the opposite gender. And as a guy, treat women with respect and as ladies, vice versa, that there's respectful interaction. And instead of envy, that I celebrate the success of others. Instead of slander, that I encourage others. Instead of speaking to, like, why is that person doing that thing? Let me see if I can just encourage them in what they are doing right. Instead of arrogance, humility, and instead of folly, wisdom. Christ died to give me a clean heart. And th there's such a profound beauty in this is because that's the starting point. I can come to him in faith and say, God, please forgive me and he'll make me a new person. But because I don't change all at once, I pull out my cokey pen of envy and I start writing on the next shirt. And here's the cool thing. I was using cool in a very understated way. This is astounding, astonishing, amazing, wonderful. Is that when I realize that anger, that envy, that slander, that whatever, that's not the way God wanted me to live. I can come to him and say, God, please forgive me. Not of the whole life, just of these actions. Please cleanse me. And there's an ongoing cleansing. So it's a one-off and it's ongoing for the rest of my life that he wants me to live clean, a clean life. That is, if you like, my running definition of holiness. People don't like the idea of holiness or hear the Bible use this word holy. But actually to be holy means to live clean. And to live clean 
basically means to live like Jesus. That's why he was pointing these things out. He wasn't just getting in their face because he was trying to be unkind. He's the kindest human being ever walked the face of the earth. He gets in our face about sin because he wants us to be clean. He gets in our face about the stains because he wants us to be pure. As I land this, three things that I need to do in order to live in this whiteness of, I'm using that in cleanliness. Well, clean shirt. Number one, acknowledge my sin. You've never put your faith in Christ. This is the starting point. Not acknowledge Jesus just as a good person. Acknowledge that I'm a sinner. And even if you are a Christ follower, we need to be acknowledging the fact that we are still in the process of being made clean. We're not perfect. There's an incredible psalm where David, who was an incredible follower of God, loved God. He, the New Testament said David had a heart after God, not just words. And he wrote a psalm acknowledging some of his sin. And this is what he wrote. He said, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Those coffee stains in my heart, I, please blot them out, take them away. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. You might say to me, Steve, I came to church just to feel happy. You know, just someone tell me how to go about live a nicer life. Well, this is the pathway. Acknowledge my sin. God knows you already. When I acknowledge that, that's the pathway. You see, it all well and good saying, well, just take your dirty shirt and just, well, just go, just start whistling. You know, just be happy. Just think better thoughts about your dirty shirt, dirty heart. No, that's not kind. This is kind. Have mercy on me, God. My verse disappeared, was cleansed from the screen. The second thing I want to be doing is repenting of my sins. Do you know what the word repent means? There's a few different meanings at its basis, but one of them means to change your mind, change the way that you think. So what I understand that to mean is that the old way of my mind thinking, I think this is just normal to go around with curry powder, coffee, permanent signs on my heart. That just felt right to live lustful, envious, angry, slanderous kind of lives. But when I repent, I say, whoa, that's a whole lot of stain right there. I change my mind and I start agreeing with God. God, I want to agree with you that that stuff's not right. That's a stain. That's not my address. I want to agree with you that those stains need to be taken out. Until I change my thinking, I can't live in his cleansing. If I keep wanting to go back to the curry pad, I think that's just normal. Well, how can God help me? When I say, God, this seems to be so much part of my behavior and my life and my ways, I feel helpless. But I don't want that to be my address. Please help me. Incredible thing happens is all of his grace is available to me. And that brings me to the third step. I can accept his cleansing. There's an amazing verse in Ephesians 5. It's actually a little, little piece about marriage. And Paul writes, actually, there's something bigger at marriage than stake here. It's our relationship with God. And this is how he describes God's relationship with us, his church. It says he wants to make her holy. It's referencing the church as a bride, because the guys and girls are under that pronoun. He wants to make her holy. Remember the word holy means clean. Cleansing her by washing with water through the word. God wants me to be engaging with his word, with him in prayer, with his people. And as I realize, man alive, that stuff has been causing me stains. I don't need to go and start all over and become a Christ. God, please, I'm an absolute sinner. Now I'm going to help. Please save me. Now, if I've done that already, it's a different kind of prayers. God, as your child, I've messed up again. One of these things, have, I've been doing them. Please forgive me. I turn, change my thinking, and then I want to accept your cleansing and walk forward, knowing that you are out for me to have a clean heart. Not just saying the right things about God, but actually living out the life that he designed me to live. Would you stand together with me, please?